I knew that I could count upon your strength, Arisen. Hello, everybody. We are back with some more fun Dragon's Dogma 2 stuff. Less than a month away. Less than a month away. And I could not be more excited. Uh, I got to play it for about three hours. Sick. Uh, three straight hours. It was really fun. Maximilian Dude was there, too. Mm -hmm. uh, he was talking about some of the same thoughts I had, actually, um, about it. Uh, I will start off by saying, boy, is Dragon's Dogma 2 a tough game to just get dropped down into the <laughs> right. middle of. Because it's like, they're like, because you know Dragon's Dogma, if you know anything about Dragon's Dogma, is that it harkens back to kind of old school kind of thought processes, right? So you might have a quest, but the quest might not exactly say like, talk to this guy the Great. quest might just be like find a person to help you with this you know and then you just kind of have to look around so that was kind of my experience on almost every quest i had in this and i'm sure that if i'd been playing the 40 hours or whatever i would have been played playing to up until the point they dropped you would know who game. the baker's son is well and I, yeah and i would know <laughs> how to play the game and i yeah. would know what class i was uh, I think the first vocation they started me at. So t today uh, we get to talk about two of the uh, more advanced vocations, the like higher, like second or third tier um, Which is why jobs. you were dropped way in the middle of it. Yeah, which is naturally why I was, I think they vaguely sort of said like we're, You're you know, not starting just punching crabs on a beach. Exactly. <laughs> we're more in the middle of the game. Like I don't know any specifics on that. I don't, I don't know any story stuff really beyond what I saw. Um, but yeah, the first first vocation that I played on Mystic Spearhand, something like that, and I really really liked this class. Nice. It, um, it was a fast uh, melee class. You have a spear. You could imbue it with magic on some attacks, and you could um, like do like I figured out after playing this class for about 50 minutes that one of the attacks that I, it was called like Magic Cut that I'd been using at melee range, I realized was actually uh, also had a ranged component. Like it, mm. it would send out a wave, you know? And I was like, I probably would have known that if I had had ch a chance to like, you know, look at my skills right, and see right. what was going on. But like, um, really cool class uh, for, you know, I really enjoy that kind of combat, like fast kind of stuff. And like, Dragon's Dogma doesn't have lock on, doesn't have any of that stuff. You gotta just kind of like go for it. And so, uh, this ability had a cool, or this vocation had a cool ability that kind of like you jump at the enemy nearest to what you're trying to aim at, you know, and you'll like hurl into the air and stuff. So, like, that became uh, a really important tool for fighting things that were not on the ground. What I love about Dragon's Dogma and the thing that really excites me, I'm sort of starting at the end with, with what I'm talking about, but like what really excites me about Dragon's Dogma 1 and what I'm so excited for in Dragon's Dogma 2 is the world of possibilities and all of the different skills and stuff that you can kit out and like how you can really tailor your gameplay style to your moveset mm. personally and like upgrading certain moves and like taking moves from other vocations and stuff sometimes right it's yeah. just so much fun and just the small taste i got of mystic spearhand or whatever the hell it's called and magic archer which was the second vocation i played i'm so excited to get to like really dive into the nitty-gritty of this stuff and like really get to deal with it um, but what did i see specifically let's see so started out in a small town uh my quest is to get through this checkpoint this door this this big portcullis gate thing um and i have a permit to get through this checkpoint and i'm like okay cool i'll just hand him this permit you know he's like the guy at the gate's like give me your permit and i'm like all right and uh then he starts yelling at me and he's like hey this is not your permit this is not for you i can't let you in here get uh -oh. out of here and then i examined the permit in my inventory, and it's a beastman, or a beastrin, I think is what they're called in this, like a beastman uh, permit. So I'm like, uh, okay, and that's dead end. I don't know what, what to do. The game doesn't tell me anything else beyond that. You okay. Know? Um, so then I go down into town, and 
while I'm trying to look around and talk to somebody, I'm like, okay, I need to look like a beast man, I guess, like to get through this gate. I don't know. Uh, some other guy talks to me about, hey, uh, these wolves kidnapped my grandson. Can you please help me? As wolves do. With that, yeah, yeah. As wolves kidnap a grandson, you know, some beasts have kidnapped my grandson. Mowgli. You know. Exactly. And um, so then I get a new quest, and I'm like, all right, I guess I'll follow this thread and see what happens. So then that starts with talking to different townspeople to get information about maybe where this kid went. You know, this is all very Dragon's Dogma. It feels so different from most modern RPGs because, like, none of this is handed to you. You know, you talk to the, the villagers and you get information like, okay, I know this kid likes to pick flowers on the hill near town to the east. Uh, and the type of flower they like blooms at night, right? Okay. And some wolves were seen over there. So you get these little little bits of information, and the map is kind enough to be like, okay, over here-ish. You know? So then I went over there, and there was this uh, campsite, which is a thing that's cool. You can camp outside um, and advance time you know, and eat and rest and all that stuff. Uh, and you need a camping pack and supplies and all that stuff. Uh, so I'm like, okay. They mention that these flowers glow at night. I'll rest until nightfall. I rest until nightfall, and there's this uh, big white there, like a big ghost, you know, lich kind of guy floating around. And so I start fighting him, and this is when I learned about that dash attack to get into the air, because I was like, how mm. do I get this guy down? So I fight and kill him. Takes a while. He's a, he's a hefty foe. I thought he was involved in that quest. Nah, just the <laughs> guy that was there, and I fought him. <laughs> Uh, I fought this griffin. I had like this. Maximilian had the same thing too. Max had the same problem too. Where like a few other people at the event, like we were all trying to kill this like griffin thing, uh, and everybody got it like almost dead, and then it would fly away. Uh, Max and I both had that experience. Like got it down to like the almost, because boss bosses have pips and like they represent different health bars, right? And uh, Dragon's Dogma franchise, not. Not known for not having enemies with a lot of hit points, you know. So, like, this griffin has, like, four hit bars. Uh, and I got it, like, an eighth of the last bar, you know, and then it flew away twice. <laughs> but it was exciting. It, like, it makes it feel kind of... And if you get back to it soon enough in the world, like, it's still down, you know, so you can try to get it. Uh, it, it feels, like, alive in that sense. But I fought this white and killed it. Um, and it was... Not impossible, but or not that hard, but it wasn't, you know, it was no pushover. Um, so then I just kind of, like, looked around. Oh, also, the pawn interactions in this are really fun. So, like, after we beat a challenging fight, mm -hmm. if you're near a pawn or walking by a pawn, you'll high-five each other. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's just like, you'll be like, I knew you could do it. Like, a high-five. <laughs> and it feels, like, natural. It doesn't, like, interrupt your motion or anything. Um, rewinding a little bit, one thing that is overwhelming in this game is how many people want to talk to you. Right. Like, in the course of trying to figure out how to get this beast disguise or whatever, and then trying to find out with, about this kid, some other guy came over and started talking to me about like a jade orb. And I was like, dude, who are you? What's going on? Because like, people know that you're the Arisen, right? So like, they, they come to you to be like, help me out, help me out, you know? Yeah. But they'll just walk up to you, and it just interrupts, you know, and, <laughs> and it takes over. It's precious. It's like the perfect. It's the right kind of dragon's dogma, like nutcase energy that we're here for. Um, anyway, it's a lot, <laughs> especially when you're just being dumped into the middle of the game. So then, yeah, after I killed the white, I was looking around, following these flowers, and they glow. And I noticed, okay, there are some flower petals going away down this kind of rocky. Crevasse, I'm like, I guess I'll just follow those, you know? Yeah. Because the game, I have no, there's no marker for this quest anymore. Completely gone, you know? And I'm just like, all right. So I follow these petals, you know, and it leads me, I see some wolves. And I'm like, okay, this is promising, you know? Keep following them, get into a, a cave, and I find the boy. Uh, and so that, that kind of experience is what's really interesting with Dragon's Dogma is like, you really have to kind of think things through and look and listen to what's going on in the world around you. And also, fast travel 
you know, in the preview I played, I had a limited number of fairy stones, right. and you had to put a port crystal somewhere in order to use them. So you do a lot of walking, just like in Dragon's Dogma, you know. So it's like so when you, so basically you create a fast travel point, and then you can always fast travel there. Or how's that you work? You create a fast travel point, and then you have stones that are expendable oh, okay. to get back to it. I imagine you can probably get an eternal fairy stone later in the game. Like in in one Dark Arisen, you got one. Just got it forever. But um, this is an assumption, but I imagine you'll be able to purchase one somewhere or find one somewhere that an eternal fairy stone or they'll become so ubiquitous that it won't really be a problem. Um, but like part of the, part of the joy of the game is kind of doing it in real yeah. time, you know, yeah, like the, that's sort of the point of it. They kinda. said that in an interview something about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's devastating if you haven't saved, haven't saved or like what happened to me at the end of my play period where it was like, I thought I needed 15 of a rock and I needed 25 of a rock. And so I went, went back to town to turn in the quest, only to realize, like, oh, I'm shy uh, 10 stones here. Uh, I guess I'll just have to walk back. <laughs> like, So be, uh, you know, on top of your details. That sounds like some kind of saying. I'm shy of 10 stones. Uh, yeah. I was sh- but I was shy 10 stones in those days. Um, there are a lot of really fun kind of pawn lines. You know, so if you don't know, in Dragon's Dogma, you have an NPC character which you create called a pawn and you have three of those two of them are made by other players and one of them is yours you can hire out the other two um and and then you have a party of four basically but it's three of them are npcs um but pawns are like a a a kind of life form in this reality uh which interestingly uh, one part of the game like some people don't maybe don't like pawns and that's kind of interesting i don't know how much about that i'm supposed to talk about but um They say voice lines. Uh, They didn't repeat them nearly as much as in Dragon's Dogma 1. I remember they said that they were trying for that. But there was one, uh, they said a few funny lines that were like, oh, okay, so you were in a player group. But like, uh, and there's something that's kind of interesting that they'll start talking and it says like, uh, I once heard this or whatever. And it'll have kind of that title above what they're saying. So Mm. it's like, here's a little anecdote. Like, here's a story. And then the heading stays there, and then they keep talking under it. So I thought that was kind of, it gives it kind of like a storyteller kind of vibe, which is kind of nice. Mayhap you will think this a trifle, but curious thing. One of my former masters chose to hire only women. I wonder why. Each to their own. So after finding the kid, I bring him back to the grand, grandpa, and then I find a forgery store who has a beast, beast mask. So okay. I buy a beast you mask. You just buy a mask. Yeah. <laughs> and I just walked up to the thing, and he was like, sure, come on through. And I was like, great. you know. Um, so that was the solution to that problem. Okay. I, I'm sure there's any number of other solutions to that, because I think what I bought was like a forgery or something. Um, I also bought what may have been a forgery for that jadeite orb, uh, and then I gave it to the guy who wanted it, because he was like, hey, I need to take this orb and sell it, because the guy who, like, I work for is a real bastard mm. and I need to escape him and is selling this will give me the money to do it. And then later that the guy who we worked for after I'd already given it to the guy and he left, he was like, Hey, this guy took off with our orb. And then he, he wanted to contract me, contract me to like go find the orb again, you know? And I was like, well, I just sold that damn orb. Uh, so one of my pawns died at some point. I think it fell in a river or something. Oh, no. Um, and they just went away. <laughs> Uh, so then I went in to hire a new pawn, and I found one named Krauser. So I hired uh. that <laughs> just for Huber. Uh, one of the pawns was talking about the illnesses that are in this game that pawns can contract if they are away in other people's worlds, which uh, is common knowledge, so I can talk about that. You can definitely very easily get into areas that are way above your pay grade. Mm. I wandered off the off the road, which is generally dangerous anyway. I was trying to save some time getting somewhere, and... Um, uh, all my pawns were basically immediately killed, and then I was grabbed by two rock monsters. Oh, oh! <laughs> uh, pretty quickly, uh, pretty quickly fell apart on me there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, That's pretty good. Um, so then, yeah, I, I switched to Magic Archer, which is how I played the game in the first game, um, and it's definitely a little more deliberate playstyle. You're ranged. You're trying to keep away from enemies more so than. 
climbing up on them and things like that. Uh, you can, like in the first game, you can. There are a couple of different ways you can shoot. Um, magic bows kind of or arrows just kind of go. Uh, otherwise, you can do sort of a precision aiming thing, but it kind of paints. It's sort of like Dead Eye. It like paints enemies okay. and then shoots magic at them. Um, in an interesting way, which that is actually pretty helpful in low light situations to like right. paint yeah, around yeah. and see where the enemies are. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, okay, I'm completely, completely surrounded. Um, so there was one mission in town in the second part. It seemed like we were in kind of the Beastron sort of town. Everyone right. there was a Beastron, and I think that's what the, the Beast race is called. Uh, and my character was also a Beastron, and one of the characters kind of gave me grief for having pawns with me, uh, they were like, "Hey, we don't like we don't like your kind around here. Like mm -hmm. pawn, like people who roll pawns aren't aren't cool by us, you know." So I got into like a bar fight. Nice. Um, but then one guy was like, "Hey, this isn't a fair fight. Like, she's one person and there's ten of you. Like, why don't you do a stand up fight?" So I got into like a duel, you know, to kind of prove myself. That was kind of fun, especially because I had literally just been dropped into my Magic Archer character and did not know how to use it, <laughs> <laughs> especially in a duel, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but that was kind of interesting, and that character was sort of a cool sellsword who was like, hey, if we meet again, I might not be friendly, but that ain't that's the job, you know. That's showbiz. I bought a house. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> just the, This lady walked up to me, and she was like, hey, you're not from around here, do you? Uh, need somewhere to live? I could sell you an apartment. And I was like, okay. And like the preview build just had, I had a bunch of money, so I just bought it. Okay. And then I walked around in it for a second and I was like, cool. Bye. Like, that was weird. Do you see places to, like, would you store things there or would you? Don't know. Okay. I just kind of walked around in there and I was like, cool. And then I left. Um, because I was trying to figure out where to find the smithy to like fix my sword, which again was not given to you in a yeah. way yeah yeah because that's the thing like does dragon does dragon's dogma have like inventory limits and stuff that you have to worry about my all this stuff? god yes yeah. um you uh get uh over encumbered almost immediately in this fucking game uh which was in the first one too there are beetles you can find on trees in this one that like lower or like i guess increase your capacity to hold stuff but yeah, you have to manage items and like give stuff to your pawns and put stuff in the inn all the time. You store them in the inns usually. Pack meals. Um, I wish, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if you have an apartment, if you can store things there too or not. That would be kind of cool. Again, with more time, like I didn't want to like spend a bunch of time. I wasn't even sure yeah. if I could show it. So I was just like, yeah, whatever. Fought a big beast in a cave while trying to find glowing stones. And I only, I found the wrong number of stones. So I would have had to go back and get more if I, Right. had more time but that's when the demo ended um yeah i mean kind of to echo what i said in the first preview video just like dragon's dogma 2 is is the right kind of vibe it's it's punishingly old school in some ways like you know you've got to walk there you've got to figure out these quests you know like if you don't think that sounds fun <laughs> you might not like it, it but does it feel more solid do you think like the performances oh yeah it it felt fine while i was playing it you know like i'm a little less sensitive to like frame rate issues than than some of you other guys but like i didn't notice any problems it was running on ps5 hardware as far as i could tell like um yeah it seemed fine to me i was seeing pretty big vistas and fighting pretty big weirdos and nothing took a noticeable hit nice you know and that's a preview build so they even they even said like hey if you see anything janky like <laughs> it's a preview build you know but i didn't really see anything out of the ordinary so it seems really solid i'm i'm really excited for dragon's dogma 2 um it it's got the right feel and i almost i almost feel bad for it for a preview setting like this because it doesn't yeah. it doesn't feel like it's not the right way to play Dragon's Dogma. Like you can't play Dragon's Dogma two under a time crunch, let alone being dropped into the middle <laughs> of the game with a with a character you've never even seen before. Like it, it was definitely an interesting uh, experience. But that's preview events for you. Yeah. Yeah, Dragon's Dogma two, dude, coming out in a couple of weeks. I'm really excited. Heck yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Check out patreon.com slash easyallies. 
to help support us. It's the best way you can do so. Also, like and subscribe if you want to hear more about video games from us. Uh, thanks. Bye. Now, here's a masterwork of craftsmanship if I ever saw one.